Islam through Art, given by Dr. Christian Gruber and organized by the Duke UNC Consortium for Middle East Studies and by the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the University of Michigan. Dr. Gruber is Professor of Islamic Art and Chair in the History of Art Department at the University of Michigan. Professor Gruber, we're delighted to have you today. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Rima. Thank you to you and Emma for all of the organizational work uh, you've put into this webinar. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here uh, with you to launch this series. So if you can bear with me for just a second, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, I will just get my laser pointer here and it will be blue, not red, so that it's not too sanguine. Mm -hmm. There we go, a little more pleasing to the eye. <laughs> so uh, Rima will also keep uh, keep time for me, so I'll really appreciate the, the five minute um, warning as we get through our clusters. Uh, today I've uh, broken up our webinar into several modules, um, three to be precise. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, architecture, ornament, and calligraphy in one module. We'll talk about figural imagery in the second module and the third module will be about street art and graffiti. So taking it all the way up to the non-fine arts, to street art and public art. But before we launch into our modules, I always like uh, to ask uh, my colleagues and my students, participants in webinars, why they're here. Um, and above all, what has brought them uh, to Islamic art? There are all sorts of reasons that one would be interested in studying Islamic art. So the first uh, sort of uh, uh, experiential exercise I'd like to do with you, which is really for me to uh, get a better understanding of uh, the participants here, is for you to type in chat some of the terms, adjectives, or materials, so artworks or different kinds of visual materials, that come immediately to your mind when you hear the expression Islamic art. Um, and Rima will start reading those out so that we can start getting a synthesis. Uh, a lot of geometry, alhamra, calligraphy, mosaics, architecture, tessellation, cordoba, um, cordoba, tiles, mukarnas, Persian paintings, blue gold, lots of colors, blue gold rugs, murals, political art. Very nice. Wonderful. So um, the spots that were named geographically were in Al-Andalus in Islamic Spain. Uh, so I find that very interesting. That, that's the sort of the, the closest we have across the, the Atlantic to the Islamic world is Islamic Spain. Of course, you know, the Islamic world um, is much broader than that. It's more than just even the Middle East. It's the entire globe uh, at this point. Um, so we've got some geography markers there that I heard. A lot of different words for geometry, tessellation. Um, one of you even knows mukarnas, which is a crystalline formation that looks like a honeycomb motif in architecture. So a lot of geometry, quite a bit of architectural ornament in the form of tessellation, which is uh, mosaic work, small individual pieces put together, uh, which, puts, uh, which creates a, a really colorful environment of decoration. I did hear one Persian painting um, and figural imagery, but you'll notice that those are usually um, in terms of sheer statistics, sort of a mental statistics, those are far below the ladder when you think about calligraphy and ornament and architecture. So that actually lays out the landscape of, of presuppositions, if you like, about what Islamic art or visual culture might be. Um, so this brings us to the, the basic terms of engagement. Um, Islamic art is a very large, rather unwieldy field um, scholars such as myself have uh, bombarded the term Islamic uh, with many questions. Uh, it's a term that sometimes hold, holds, sometimes doesn't. Uh, when you get to the George Floyd uh, video, you'll ask yourself, why are we even talking about this? How is this even Islamic art? Um, that's because the term Islamic art is just so broad and amorphous. It encompasses even the graffiti of the, the Middle East. So 
we want to go into the field knowing that that the, it is very unwieldy and incredibly elastic. Within that flexibility and elasticity, there are nevertheless a number of presuppositions um, and concepts that have held sway over time. Uh, one of the basic uh, presuppositions about Islamic art that you will hear frequently is that it's an an iconic art, and it's uh, the first term right here. Does anybody know what an iconism is? M might want to put that in chat for Rima to, to read out. No icons, uh, no direct representation of things, supernatural, mm -hmm. anti icons. Right. So there, there's a difference between an iconism and iconoclasm, and these terms can get a little bit uh, confusing. So an iconism is a general shying away or um, um, staying away from images. So it's not really an aversion to images. It's just uh, you know, a disregard or a not willingness to engage with image making. And what I mean by images here is figural representation, representations of animate entities. Uh, that includes humans, of course, and then non-human animals, such as uh, birds and dogs and cats and, and what have you. So an iconism is just the staying away of figural representation. So it's a bit of a neutral position, which is different from iconoclasm right here. And you'll notice that the term has the, uh, a, a word from the Greek, clasm, which, which uh, is related to clash or battle. So this term is much more powerful. Iconoclasm is the act of breaking of figural images. You go out of your way to destroy figural imagery as opposed to simply being neutral and, and, and staying clear. And as of late, you know, especially after the Danish cartoon controversy of, of 2005, uh, which was a moment when a really horrific, uh, satirical, disrespectful cartoons of Muhammad were produced, we could see that the discourse on Islamic art was further, further entrenched into these presupposition binaries, you know, what makes Islam different from other things. Um, and in that entrenchment of binaries, we hear quite a bit still today that Islam is an iconoclastic religious tradition, that it, it breaks icons. Um, examples that are given include the Taliban who, who uh, blew up the Buddhas of Bamiyan. Many of you have lived through that event. And then of course, more recently, that discourse has become even further entrenched with ISIS destroying uh, ancient Middle Eastern heritage in Iraq and Syria. Um, the problem though with aniconism and uh, iconoclasm as general parameters for de defining uh, Islam and its visual cultures is only a small portion of a moving equilibrium. And we wanna be careful not to overemphasize that which we think is a differentiating factor for the faith and its visual traditions because there is plenty of iconography, and that's the third term, which means uh, basically the depiction of figural um, representations, but also the capacity for us to read their modes and their grammars, their constituent elements. Iconography is the reading of an image. That's what it means. And having those tools, uh, means uh, gaining the toolkit or the set of skills that you need to be able to understand what you're looking at and how you can interpret it. Iconography is, is a major component, component of art history as a field. Um, it's also known as visual literacy. And uh, the second module today when we talk about figural imagery will involve heavy, uh, a heavy iconographical exercise that I hope you will be able to uh, redeploy it with your own students because it's very important to teach our younger students to slow down, to really look at images so that they're not duped, so they understand how you can actually craft an argument through data that is historical and happens to not be necessarily textual, um, but rather pictorial or, or visual. Do any of you have any questions about these three terms before I go to the next slide?
We're looking good, Rima. Yes. I don't see any questions yet, yet, Professor Gruber. Good. And it is 5.14 p.m. since I've just interrupted you. Excellent. So uh, there are all these presuppositions that somehow Islamic art is essentially or ideologically unique that it is opposed to other traditions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, but that's not the case. Uh, Islam is implicated in other world cultures uh, and face, uh, although it does have its own uh, unique contributions, of course. Uh, another presupposition is somehow it's unified or homoge homogeneous across geography, but the Alhambra looks nothing like the Taj Mahal, uh, although there are some shared characteristics. Um, the other presupposition we want to sort of cast aside now more than even ever is that Islamic art is tantamount or synonymous with Arab art. Uh, Islamic art can be a Persian art, can be a Central Asian art, it can be an Indonesian art, it can be an American art, it can be a Chinese art. So uh, countries need not be majoritarian Muslim even to have Islamic art. So it can, it, it can take place anywhere since the arrival of Islam and manifest itself in local variants. So it's, it's fluid and um, uh, polyvalent and um, very capacious as a field of production. And it is by no means just strictly geometric or ornamental or devoid of figural imagery. And that's where you see that there are some very productive tensions for us to explore unity versus plurality. So since we did talk about architecture and ornament calligraphy, as we started off, I wanted to now launch into our first module, uh, which I think puts us right uh, in time. And for this, we have approximately 20 minutes. So until about 5.36 uh, or so. Uh, there are many case studies that you could bring into your classroom uh, to talk about Islamic art. Um, oftentimes architecture is brought into the mix. Uh, you might wanna teach the Alhambra or the great mosque of Cordoba, which had been a church and then became a church again, although it was uh, a Visigothic temple before that. So a lot of sacred sites are what I call palimpsestic. So they're layered one on top of e each other. Um, and, and, and creating that lineage of cultures is important. And you find that here at the Dome of the Rock. As many of you know, the Dome of the Rock uh, is in Jerusalem. It's one of these major sites that if, if you're looking at an aerial shot of the city, you can't help but notice the gold dome shimmering on the Temple Mount. And this spot is very important uh, for many communities, especially the Jewish community. This is the site of the Jewish temple, uh, which was des destroyed twice. And uh, members of the Jewish community believe that it will be rebuilt at some point uh, in the future. Uh, the Temple Mount uh, is considered also sacred uh, to Muslims. Uh, this is known as Al-Haram al-Sharif, or the Noble Enclosure. Uh, and the Dome of the Rock is the um, centerpiece of uh, this particular sacred space. In fact, the Dome of the Rock is considered the third holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina. The reason for that is because Jerusalem is considered the city of the prophets, uh, the city where uh, resurrection will occur, last judgment and resurrection. And also it's believed that the rock upon which this building was erected houses a footprint of the prophet Muhammad when he ascended into the skies. So the, the building is a bit of a reliquary, an architectural reliquary for a footprint relic. Um, so this was the, this is the earliest dated architectural endeavor for Islam. Of course, the Kaaba has been around longer, but it's very hard to track the chronology of the structure today. This one has uh, remained more or less intact over, over many, many centuries, stretching all the way from 690 until today. Uh, it was a group of, yeah. sorry, we have, a, we have a, a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, can you, can you speak to about Al-Aqsa Mosque, but is there any particular reason why no minarets have been added to this particular structure? So two questions. Excellent questions. Yes. So the Al-Aqsa Mosque is in the same uh, complex here, but it's a set apart mosque that is in a traditional mosque structure. It's known as basilical. So you have aisles 
um, that lead to a wall that then faces Mecca. That's known as a Qibla wall. So Al-Aqsa Mosque is a mosque proper. This is a circular plan and we'll talk about what that plan is. Now, the early Islamic texts refer to the Dome of the Rock as a mosque, as a masjid, as a place of prostration. But you'll see from the interior, this is not a place where you can have communal salah, so a prayer. So it doesn't really function like a mosque as we know it today. And oftentimes you'll hear people referring to the Dome of the Rock as Al-Aqsa Mosque, but that's incorrect. Al-Aqsa Mosque is a separate mosque from the Dome of the Rock. These are two independent entities that happen to all be in this uh, on the Temple Mount. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why there wouldn't be minarets added to this structure because it functions much less as a mosque than as a tomb, as a, a, as a reliquary. So um, the call to prayer is not sounded from this building and you do have minarets at uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I hope that answers those questions. Thank you, Professor Gruber. Thank you. Excellent questions. Please feel free to chime in anytime. I really enjoy them. So you'll notice that this structure is octagonal. It's in the round, which is unusual. Mosques tend to be more rectangular. Um, the dome is gold. Uh, the original textual sources tell us that the Umayyads, including Abdel Malik, the Umayyad ruler who commissioned this building, had conquered so much territory and had become so powerful and wealthy in the process that they amassed enormous amounts of dinars. Dinars are gold coins. And they had such a, an overabundance of dinars that they thought, why not smelt them and then cover the dome uh, in that symbol of affluence and power. So just the sheer gold becomes a material symbolism for the ascendancy of Islam in the Eastern Mediterranean by the end of the seventh century. So within a generation of the Prophet Muhammad's death, we've got this uh, very strong statement of Umayyad ascendancy uh, through the Dome of the Rock. What you see today now on the outside is uh, tile work. Try to imagine that this was not the case. These tiles here were put on the building in the 1550s by the famous Ottoman Sultan, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. And he put those tiles on there because the original mosaic, the tessellation, had peeled off because of the elements, because of bad weather. So try to engage in this conceptual exercise. Imagine the entirety of the outside of this building in fine, fine mosaic work and not tile work. And that's what the building would have looked like from 690 to the 1550s. But of course, when you've got small mosaic work, they'll start peeling off and then you'll need a restoration or a renovation campaign. And that's what happened in 1550. So buildings are not built. They change over time. They're verbal nouns. They're like living entities, right? Now, the building itself, as I mentioned, is octagonal. It has eight sides. Um, it's got here a drum uh, which holds up the dome. And you'll notice that the entire plan of the structure is central. So this is what's known as a centrally planned building, right? Because there's a center point and you build around it. So it's not like, say, the, the capital in DC where you've got sort of a rectangular frame to it. The center point is the rock. Uh, and this is basically a raw out, uh, rocky outcrop of Mount Moriah itself. Uh, which is believed to uh, have the footprint of the prophet. So the, think about this, the whole building has been built around that rocky outcrop as a contain, architectural container of sorts. And it has two rings. Rima, is there a question? Yes, yes. Um, if you'd like to answer it now, it's actually about tile work. So I don't know if you would like to finish your, your, what you're saying right now and then address it, but it says, when the tile work was added, were they using similar patterns of tile work as that which Sinan used in Istanbul? Absolutely, great question. In fact, Sinan was in charge of this uh, renovation campaign um, here in Jerusalem. So all of that tile work is thanks to Sinan, the Ottoman chief architect, who's very famous. Uh, the patterns that you see on the outside here are very similar to the other patterns that were being used in mosques in Istanbul and in Iznik um, and in other places in Ottoman lands. 
And so those tiles actually don't reflect what the original mosaics would have looked like. Um, and you'll see what those mosaics would have looked like when we look at the mosaics uh, on the interior, in the interior. Excellent question. So returning to our rock, our rock is our centerpiece. It's our node. Everything gyrates, rotates around that. Um, and the rotational plan is basically comprised of two ambulatories. Uh, the word ambulatory means an aisle or space around which you walk, right? around which you amble. It's an amble space, a walking space. And we have two ambulatories. We have an inner ambulatory, so an ambulatory that's close to the rock, and an outer ambulatory, so one that's closer to the outside. So think about it this way. You've got your rock in the center, an inner ring, and an outer ring, which means that when you visit the Dome of the Rock, you can, you can walk around it in a circle, and you can have two circles circumambulating the rock. So the whole building precipitates a very precise form of physical locomotion, which is a walking in the round. And that's very different from, from a, a regular mosque where you walk towards the Qibla wall and then you prostrate. So that's a linear progression, whereas this one is circumrotational. You go in the round. And the way that this functions is that you've got a series of piers and columns that make arcades. Um, so you've got these arcades here that create your inter, inner ambulatory, and then the wall right here that creates your outor ambulatory. And Professor yeah. Ruben, um, a question for you. Do the two ambulatories have different functions? Very good question. Today, they don't. However, in Umayyad times, we know from textual sources that sometimes this arcade right here had tie beams, which are uh, like curtain rods, essentially, and curtains would be hanging. And sometimes you would have the entire rock closed off from vision with these curtains. And then these would be lifted up for a kind of um, dynamic apparition of the rock. And so if you happen to be close to the rock, you would have inner access to it. And if you were in the outer ambulatory, then you might not have direct gaze of that sacred spot. So it could, uh, those two ambulatories helped actually stagger the rhythm of being able and being allowed to see this uh, holy of holies, essentially. We have a, a, a wonderful follow-up remark. It says, that's so interesting. It actually reminds me of some of the portions of the Orthodox services I attended when I lived in Bulgaria, especially at Easter. Absolutely. The Eastern Orthodox Church um, actually does not allow its congregants past a certain screen where the clergy will be standing. Uh, in other words, in, in the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition, you're not allowed to see beyond a certain point, whether it's with curtains or you know, big icon panels. And that note is so interesting for me because we're in Jerusalem and immediately before the arrival of Islam, we have Byzantium, right? Which is Eastern uh, Orthodox, Christianity. And so there are these really interesting interminglings here and commonalities that um, as teachers, we want to make sure that we stress uh, to counter all of these discourses we hear today that always want to say Islam is different in this and this and this way, hypostatizing it, othering it. It is different in some ways, but it's also very similar. And this is one of uh, the ways it's similar. Another way that this building will help you draw those connections is that this particular plan is known as a martyrium plan right here. It's in green. Uh, a martyrium plan, as the name suggests, is a building type or shape that is intended to house a martyr. Uh, and a martyr is an individual who died for their faith, uh, pursued hardship, stayed steadfast, um, and usually the martyrium plan is basically a tomb plan, a tomb for a saintly person. And so what's very interesting with the Dome of the Rock and what makes it so unusual 
in terms of the history of Islamic architecture is that it looks much more like a saint's tomb from Christian traditions than a, a prayer space from the Islamic mosque tradition. Uh, and so as a sort of uh, transitional architectural object, it reveals some very interesting similarities to the Holy Sepulchre also in Jerusalem and other Christian uh, shrines that are in the Holy Land as well. And um, that is the century planned tomb-like martyrium plan. So the plan itself actually gives some of these things away. Now the inside is glorious. Some of you might have been in, it, it's just uh, dazzling. You never forget the experience. When you go in, you're confronted with a, a symphony of, of patterns and textures. Uh, the center of course is the rock right here, raw, just unadulterated raw outcrop stone. And this is known as a sahra in, in Arabic. And in fact, Dome of the Rock, some of you already know the term, is known as Qubbat al-Sahra, meaning the Dome of the Rock. So the building is the Dome over the Rock. That's the technical term uh, of the building, Qubbat al-Sahra. Um, and right here, you see a tiny little building, micro building. It's like a little um, window with a little dome. And that is like a reliquary case for the footprint itself. Um, and that was built in Ottoman times to protect what is believed to be a footprint of the prophet on the rock. Now, Question for you, Professor. Uh, is it at all significant that the rock here and use as prayer space has some similarities to the stone meteor in the Kaaba? Is this a repeated theme in other parts of the Islamic world? You know, that's a really excellent question. You know, and this is something I've been thinking about very actively uh, lately, especially since there's a turn towards uh, eco-critical art history. And I think that art historians such as myself have not paid attention to natural features of Islamic built uh, structures. Um, and so what I'm doing now is I'm saying, well, listen, let's look at the Kaaba. When you think about it, the Kaaba is also um, an architectural housing of the black stone. As you know, individuals circumambulated and they wanna kiss and touch the black stone, which is a meteorite. And of course the Zamzam well is there. So there's holy water. So you have holy water and holy rock at the Kaaba. When you think about Medina, which is where the prophet Muhammad is buried, where his house mosque is located, there's a very famous date palm tree uh, that is believed to have talked and even walked towards the prophet in some Islamic sort of more mystical texts. So there was a miraculous palm tree in Medina. And of course the soil is considered sacred because that's where the prophet is in Hume. So the soil and tree is very important um, for Medina. And then when you think about Jerusalem, the rock and water also is very important because this is believed to be where the four rivers of paradise emerge. So we have to really think carefully about how we present Islamic architecture because we have to re-embed these structures into their natural environments, which means really talking about rocks, soil, trees, water, the, the whole panoply. But that, you know, that remains to be done as very serious scholarly work for sure. So great question. Um, so besides the rock, which is kind of like a relic in and of itself, we have an, an immense amount of gorgeous mosaic work. These are small tesserae, the small pieces that are put together uh, kind of like a puzzle, um, a lot of uh, gilding, um, a lot of lapis lazuli, so very expensive stuff. Um, and mosaic work, as many of you know, is a very Byzantine artistic tradition. The Islamic textual sources tell us that Abd al-Malik, quote unquote, gathered artisans from his dominions to ornament the Dome of the Rock. And scholars have been then asking, were some of these artisans Christian? And it's highly likely that that was the case, uh, that we have a, a mixed sort of corpus of individuals that contributed to this vocabulary. The big thing though to keep in mind is that uh, Christian and Byzantine mosaic work is highly figural. So if you think about Ravenna, if you think about Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, mosaics of the Virgin Mary and Jesus Christ. These are all sort of hallmark features of Byzantine Christian art. 
This is not the case here. Even if you have Christian mosaicists who are contributing, there's not a single image of a human being inside this structure. And you won't find figural representations in mosques in general, as a general rule. Remember, like, yes, yes, please. Uh, takes us back a bit. I apologize. This is from Ross. And he says, given that this is a central building built out around the rock, it seems that the footprints are not in the center. What is the center focal point on the rock? Mm. Very good question. There is no strong focal point because the, the sort of the point of the rock is actually the motion of the circle. Now this said the, the most uh, dynamically charged point of the rock is the footprint right here. So you will see um, pilgrims and visitors coming and they will touch uh, the grill here and they will want to take a peek of uh, at the footprint. Uh, there are a number of footprints of the Prophet Muhammad that are scattered throughout Islamic lands. There are quite a few in Istanbul proper. Um, they're believed to carry baraka, which is a sort of latent form of blessings. And so kissing or rubbing them or, or, or cleaning them with water is believed to, to bring about some, some blessings uh, in potentia. So it, it's believed to carry a kind of energetic force, an aura or charisma. Great. And we are at 5.35, five minutes before your next segment, Professor Gruber. Excellent. So what I want to do now is actually go straight into the major features of those mosaics because they have ornament, they have vegetation, they have calligraphy. It's all non-figural. And that ornamentation establishes a language for Islam in the early period. And so scholars have said, well, if it's not figural, if we have these really interesting plant motifs and crown motifs and calligraphies, then if it's not sending a message with figures, what are the messages uh, that are being sent in geometric and vegetal form and of course through writing? So there have been a number of questions that have been posed. What, what are these representations? What are their symbolic meanings? Who made them? Most likely a, a, a melange of individuals. Where are they getting their their sources of inspiration. And then last but not least, who was the audience? You know, if there's a message, who's the message guided to in the end? And is the message being received? Um, so there is no straightforward answer here, but there are uh, various possibilities, uh, ends of approach, if you want. First, we've got lots of crowns, jeweled crowns, like here and here. And scholars have said that they think these crowns represent uh, the uh, Umayyad victory over the Sasanians. The Sasanians were Zo uh, Zoroastrians who ruled over the land of Iran and the Umayyads defeated them at a famous battle before the building of the Dome of the Rock. So crowns are believed to represent political regalia, you know, fancy items of political power. And here it might represent the Umayyad victory over the Sasanians. So the Umayyad taking over of Iran, massive territory. So there's a political uh, component here to the message. The other uh, major component here is pearls. And what's fascinating with all of these pearls that you see studying uh, these mosaics is that uh, many of the royal treasuries that came into Umayyad possession through all of these battles that uh, in which they were victorious included treasuries of gems and jewels and coins and other luxurious goods. And that included, of course, lots and lots of pearls. And we know from the Islamic textual sources that a very large, enormous, almost the size of an ostrich egg, we're told, an enormous pearl was uh, connected to a chain and was uh, hanging in the middle of the dome from the apex of the dome over the rock. And that pearl was believed to, to be unlike any other pearl in the world in its size and its sheen. And it was called al-yatima, which means the orphan. And so it might represent the luxury that came, uh, the, the, also the wealth that came into Umayyad possession. And it could have reflected that pearl that was hanging in the structure itself. So we've got crowns, we've got pearls, we've got lots of vegetal motifs, lots of vines and um, leaves and things like that, scroll-like motifs. Um, a lot of scholars say these are really fantastic sort of vegetal designs that are otherworldly. They're not real. 
And so maybe then the Dome of the Rock is supposed to reflect paradise. Um, and this is after all the place of, uh, of the last judgment and resurrection. So maybe if you're a Muslim and in the building, you're, you're being told that you have arrived at the place of resurrection and you are now in a salvific space that is uh, like the Garden of Eden, uh, potentially. And then- Sorry, a quick question yeah. for you. I know we're thinking about the time, but uh, Asma wants to know, could it, I believe the Paul also represent that Muhammad was an orphan? And Tia just wants to confirm that the objects were political trophy items as well, just yes. confirming that. Yes, they're political trophy items, um, spolia, uh, like the Romans did. Um, and I find it also very interesting that al-yatima, which means orphan, it could be also, I mean, this is really in the, in the realm of the conjectural, it could be sort of um, a gemological pointing back to the prophet Muhammad himself, who, as you know, was, uh, was left an orphan uh, very, very early in his lifetime. But that also made him a, a rare gem at the same time, right? And then uh, lastly, uh, lots of hanging lamps uh, were uh, there with curtains. So it was a shimmering, multi-sensorial, luxurious space, but it also was sending, and this is sort of the, the last major component here, um, it was also sending messages. And what's important with the Dome of the Rock is that it's the earliest dated example of the Quran. There is no other Quran written on parchment that is dated and that dates before this. So if you teach the Dome of the Rock, you also have to teach the history of the Quran because the earliest dated evidence for the Quran is not on a piece of paper, it's not on parchment, it's in this building. And so that is what's really fascinating here is that we've got different verses that are extracted in Arabic in a very ang angular lapidary script that's kind of hard to read, it's known as Kufic. And what do those verses say? They say, there is no God but God, he has no partner, right? So for those of you who know Arabic, la ila illallah, and here, la sharik lehu, lehu al mulk, he has power or kingdom is his. So God is unique, it is, so this is a declaration of pure monotheism. There are lots of prayers for the prophet as well. And this is what differentiates Islam from the Judeo-Christian complex, because it's not enough to say there is only one God, Muhammad is the messenger of God. So that's the addition. So the addition of the prophet indicates that this is a, a, a Muslim building. So prayers upon the prophet Muhammad. And to my mind, probably the most interesting verse from the Quran that's been selected for extraction here is uh, the command to the people of the book, O oh, people of the book, ya ahl al-kitab in Arabic, do not say they are three. So the message here is anti-Trinitarian, which means it is, uh, it, 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 the building is positioning itself against Christianity, against the notion of you know, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as a Trinity. So that begs the question, why, why put that in there? I mean, are Christians utilizing the site? And if so, can they even read Arabic, and even if they can read Arabic, can they read that Arabic all the way up there in a script that's not pointed, that's lapidary, that's very hard to decipher? So these are some questions that remain, but we do know that churches and mosques were shared spaces in the early Islamic period. Um, and so it's quite possible then that the Dome of the Rock catered to a Christian audience and might have been there to lure them over to the faith through, through the, the positive potential of positive argumentation, right? Conversion by the pen, not the sword. Conversion by beauty in this case. And so when you think about the Dome of the Rock, really to sum things up here, the Dome of the Rock was really meant to celebrate the arrival of Islam in a very holy city, the city of the prophets, to make a spot for the prophet Muhammad in that, on the Temple Mound for one of his big miracles. Um, it was there to also in, invite circumambulation around a holy site, emulating the Kaaba. But it also draws upon and extends the Byzantine tradition. And it seems to engage in a cross-faith dialogue 
where, whereby, of course, this is an Islamic faith, but it's intended to lure potentially other uh, individuals over to Islam as a powerful new entity where there are other possibilities for rising through the state apparatus um, and to gain power as well. So th this would be what you would call a Bizano, and here I've written it down, a Bizano Islamic monument. It meaning it's somewhere between Byzantium and Islam. And many monuments are actually syncretistic. Uh, they draw on local traditions. They're engaged and dialectic. And uh, that holds true for the Dome of the Rock as well. So Rima, I think we've probably reached time and there might be some more questions on this module. Yes. It is 5.44 PM local time. And uh, Maha wants to know, can you explain how conversion is not by the sword when Islam in fact spread via military conquests? Ah. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a big debate within Islam. You know, there are debates over uh, how you convert. Uh, there are conversions by the sword, it's known as Biseif, and conversions by the pen, which is known as Bikalam. And so there are different ways of conversion. Of course, military victories spread Islam throughout these domains, but that wasn't going to sustain the faith in those locales unless there were other potential ways of, of thriving within the faith, uh, culturally, logistically, and so on. So of course, military uh, parties and, and uh, of course, malaise were, were part of the mix, but this building shows the, uh, the other component for the spread and the longevity of Islam, which is that once you, you are in a land, you have to create a system uh, of society in which uh, many participants have a stake. Um, and you do that through the power of positive argumentation and not through sheer might. And that's where soft, diplom the soft diplomacy in architectural form uh, contributes its, its own part. So Rima, are you still there? Yes, thank you. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Professor Gruber. Great, thank you. So if you guys are ready, do you want to take a tiny breather or we can head straight into the second module? How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah, I think so. I think we're ready. All right, let's do it. So if you want to read up before we move on, I suggest you know for your libraries that you get Oleg Rabar's book on the Dome of the Rock. Um, We've uploaded Nasser Rabat's article on the Dome of the Rock in, into our Google Drive. Reema, I don't know if you guys have already shared that or you'll do it after maybe. Yes, afterwards. Okay. And uh, if you want to know what the mosaics uh, looked like on the outside originally, you can also uh, watch Heba Mustafa's video on the exterior mosaics on a website uh, called Hamsina. I'll tell you more about that website in our third module. So that brings us to uh, the next question. Well, what about figural imagery, and we have 15 minutes for this. There's a lot that can be said about figural imagery in Islam. The first is pedagogues. Uh, what we need to be aware of is that figural imagery has always brought about certain anxieties uh, in many cultures. In Judaism, it's rare to see figural representation, although there are exceptions to the rule. There is an illustrated Haggadah, some of you might be familiar with Dura Europos in Syria, a very, very early synagogue that has lots of figural frescoes on it. So even in Judaism, uh, there, there's a waxing and waning. In Christianity, many of you are familiar with Byzantine iconoclastic uh, moments. Of course, the Lutheran tradition and the whitewashing of churches was another such moment. And so these ebbs and flows of loving figural imagery and then destroying them or being scared of them, you know, worshiping the image instead of God or what it represents has always been a problem in many traditions, even in Buddhism. Um, so this, and Islam is no exception to this, um, but in those anxieties, there's a, a plethora of figural depictions. You can find images of humans in palaces, in bathhouses, on ceramics, in book arts, um, in metalwork, in textiles. Figural imagery is pervasive in Islamic art. So it's important to make a point of that because um, you can have iconoclasm alongside 
the lavish production of figural imagery and everything in between. So we've got a moving equilibrium. And what I'd like to do now in these 15 minutes is engage uh, you with an exercise um, that, I, that I call simply visual analysis. And what I've done is picked an image of the Prophet Muhammad himself. Now, when or if you teach this subject, uh, of course, you want to uh, exert caution. Uh, you want to be respectful. Uh, you want to find a right way into the subject because this is a tricky subject for many. Uh, what you want to say is that you understand that uh, certain individuals do not believe that these things exist or they shouldn't be looking at them. It's up to you to decide whether you want to show the entire trajectory because there are figural images of Muhammad uh, that depict him fully. And then there are others that are completely abstract. Again, you've got the whole equilibrium. Um, for me, I always like the compromise position. So I've picked an image where the Prophet Muhammad's face is veiled so that you have something between uh, figural depiction and abstraction. And that's where I think Muslim artists are stupendous because they find a really smart, astute way of handling immense complexity when it comes to philosophy, uh, questions about ontology, you know, right? The, the how is the how does the Prophet Muhammad exist? How can I even represent this uh, this incredible entity using my own skills, right? A poet might use language, but how is an artist going to convey the the, the very multitudinous dimension of a prophet? It's a it's a tricky situation, and it requires skill and finesse. And so, what I'd like to do is walk you through one image. This is a painting of the Prophet Muhammad which is included in a Persian illustrated manuscript. It was made in Iran in, right around 1540 for a ruler uh, of a dynasty known as the Safavid dynasty. And that ruler's uh, name is Shah Tahmasp. Shah Tahmasp uh, was a, a staunch Shi, so not a Sunni, a Shi, and he implemented all sorts of procedures to further Shiify uh, Persian lands. And still today, Iran is heavily Shi um, in, its, uh, in its worldview. Now, this manuscript is, contains a text. And that text is a Persian poem written by a very famous and beloved writer named Nizami. And the poem is known as the Quintet because it has five books. And the word for five in Arabic and other languages is Khamsa. So it's the five books. Nestled into one of these, known as the Seven Beauties, right at the beginning is a praise to God and a praise to the prophet and his uh, supreme miracle, which is his celestial ascension into the heavens, right here. Um, and so the, the painter here has had to make many choices about what he wants to represent. And here, Rima, I'd love to do another little sort of quick, you know, fire off of what you see. If you guys can just put some words in the chat, what do you see here? It will help us actually see better the painting. Sure. Angels, gifts, light, fire, cloud, celestial imagery, wings, lilies, stars, fire and wind, vines, calligraphy, lamps, uh, animals, lots of red, Asian, Persian, human horses, water, question mark, chimera, clouds. Super. Yeah, I like the water question mark. You may be referring to this right here, and we'll talk about that. Right, so we've got so many elements, and that's been plotted very carefully by the artist, and we want to sort of look through them one by one. So that's something you can do with your students, which is a visual exercise. And it's very important to get our younger students to really slow down and to look at something you know, with focused attention these days and not just to scroll through something thinking they know what they're seeing. So you just slow them down here. Start with the center. You've got a pivot, right? Smack in the center. At the center of your attention is the Prophet Muhammad. Um, he's right here and he's seated on Burak which is his human-headed flying steed. Islamic tradition states that Burak was the steed of the prophets before Muhammad, 
and it is upon this mythical creature that Muhammad uh, traveled from Mecca to Jerusalem, and some narratives say that, they, that he also went through the skies on Burak. So this is his celestial ascension vehicle. So we've got Burak, uh, the steed of the prophet, and then Muhammad, for his part, has a couple different features that have been carefully articulated and selected. One, the facial features are not shown. And that's a conscientious choice on, the, on behalf of the artist. The artist has decided to give him a white facial veil right here. And the artist has also decided to give him a very specific kind of headgear, which is not just a simple white crown, but it is, or turban, it is a turban that has actually a tall rod right here. You can barely see it in that overarching flaming halo, but you can see kind of here like a rod right in the center. This um, turban with a tall rod around which the turban is actually enwrapped is known as the Taj Haidari or Haidar's crown. And uh, does anybody know what it represents? out there. Sometimes we have folks who, who know these things. So Haidar's crown. Rima, did somebody answer? No, no, no. And I, it's, I wanted to let you know that you have five minutes left. So you might want to think about what to um, proceed with and and what to cut out, but no, we have no submission, someone says. That's, a, I guess, a submission. It was the royal headgear of the Safavid monarchs, and it represented Shi Islam. So the artist has put a Shi symbol on top of the head of the prophet. So Muhammad is kind of being Shiified. He's being entered into sectarian contestation here. Um, so you can have those kinds of vying. And then the question, of course, is, you might explain to your students, well, there's a facial veil because they don't represent facial features of the prophet, but that's such a cheap, easy, facile explanation that skirts all the complexities that went into the decision to apply the facial veil. And if you look in the Persian poem itself, uh, and here we've got two different parts of the Hamsa right here, we have the poet saying, reason is distracted for love of your face, right? So his face is so overwhelmingly beautiful that, you know, it's discombobulating. He, the, the power of his beauty is so overwhelming. You have other lines that, that address the prophet that say, be the secret uh, behind the veil of mystery. So Muhammad is, is of course, a human. He's not more than human in the Islamic uh, context, but he's also imagined as much more than human, that he's a, a cosmic secret, that he's a veil of mystery. And in fact, he's often described as a veil or a curtain. Um, you can't really penetrate the, the sort of sacred aura. He's not sacred, right? He's a human, but there's an aura that's more than human about him. And that's how the artist is conveying that more than human quality. So it's not just about hiding his facial features. It's about saying, listen, he's much more than that. And you can't even begin to contemplate the ontology, the nature of the Prophet Muhammad's being, because it's so supreme, beyond intellection, beyond reason. So the facial veil is super smart uh, in, in, in that sense, at the same time as it skirts the problem of figure representation. So we've talked a little bit about uh, the Taj Haidari. The Prophet Muhammad is also conceptualized very often, especially in poetry, as a glowing light. Um, even in Islamic doctrine, there's something known as the Nuri Muhammadi or the light of Muhammad. And some of you noticed a hanging lamp here. And here's an incense burner. And here's a tray emitting light right here. And Muhammad, for his part, is emitting an enormous aureole or halo of light. And that's because uh, Muhammad is believed to be the light of, of God and that Muhammad was created as light but then generated all of existence before his physical manifestation on earth. So he's a primordial substance and through both his being and the revelation of the Quran becomes an enlightenment to mankind. And there are many, many verses in Persian poetry, including here in this book that this painting illustrates that talk about Muhammad as being so luminous that 
he gives his own light to the stars right there. In dark night, that light giving lamp was sealed by his high wishes stamp. So God sealed him with that light. So you have the facial veil, you've got the Taje Haidari, you've got uh, the light metaphor. Um, we don't need to spend time on that, but this is the moon. Somebody might have thought this was water, but Muhammad is often described in Persian poetry as Moh, which means moon in Persian. Um, so, you know, sometimes he's addressed as if you are the moon, show us a little light. So Muhammad is also put through lunar metaphors, highly poetic, right? Um, this is Sufi, so it's a spiritualized way of thinking about the prophet. So he's the moon, he's the light, he's, he smells beautiful, he's, a, he's related to incense burners, right? So there's a lot of a sort of prophetic perfume that's involved. So this is right here, an incense burner. So it's almost like the painting is starting to, to emit a patina of beautiful smells like musk and rose and frankincense and all of those are used to describe the prophet as well. So he smells beautiful, he emits light, he's too beautiful for comprehension, he can be sheified, um, but he also is a caliph, he's a ruler. And right here you see an angel carrying a green fabric which is no doubt his green mantle of prophecy, uh, which is now housed in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul. So he's a supreme prophet, right? This is Daula, this is the state, or, or supreme prophet, this is Deen, this is religion, but he's also the supreme caliph or ruler of the Daula of the state. So state and religion are combined in his, in his double role as a king that has two bodies, right? The divine body and the political body. So you've got that. And of course, he, as a ruler, he's also the wearer of the crown of rulership, even though he wears a turban. So you have symbols of political power that are endowed uh, to him. Um, and of course, uh, over in this corner right here, you have an angel carrying a closed book, a codex, which is no doubt the Quran. So Muhammad received um, a few verses of the Quran during his uh, celestial ascension. And he spoke directly with God without any intermediary. And so here you see the angels are not just angels, they're tributary angels. They gift him his ontology. The angels give Muhammad that which he is. So they give him revelation, so enlightenment. They give him prophecy. They give him power. They give him light. They give him his sweet smelling incense. And Muhammad, for his part, is the centerpiece of this in, uh, immensely complex, beautiful sort of rounded composition that for the artist aims to capture in one image a very complex totality for the prophetic being and corpus. And that's the power of the visual mode. Imagine how, mu how much time you'd have to spend explaining it like I just did verbally, right? Muhammad is this, he's this, he's this, he's this, he's imagined as this, he's conceptualized as that. But all of that is telescoped into one single powerful image, right? Images are worth a thousand words, and this is one of them. And this is something that you can definitely uh, build an entire exercise around with your students. So Arima, I think we're at time now too, so I'd be happy to take questions as well for this module. I think there's so many comments, but I think because of the uh, time, I'll, I'll ask two for you. And if you don't mind, um, I'll ask them very slowly and then you, you answer them as you wish, Professor Gruber. Here's the first one. Could there be a connection between fire light imagery here and the centrality of fire in Zoroastrian tradition? And then the second is in light of the smells, how does this, how does that relate to the perfumed garden? Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you know, fire, um, water, soil, um, and other elements are considered sacred in Zoroastrianism. And, and of course, there are Zoroastrian fire temples, they're known as Ateshkades, that are there to maintain an ever burning flame. You can visit those in Iran. Um, so, there is, a, I would say, you could say there are a link. Um, there's a link to Zoroastrian symbols of the fire. But at the same time, the, the symbol of the, the glowing light is um, endemic to Islam. And in fact, it's, it's woven right in the Quran itself. 
Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Quran, you'll of course know a verse, a very famous verse that's known as the verse of light, Ayat al-Nur. Um, and that verse uh, basically equates the prophet, uh, at least in the exegetical tradition, so the tradition of interpreting verses in the Quran. So they interpret in those verses a, a tabernacle and a lamp that is lit with you know, oil that is not of the East or the West. They equate that glowing lamp uh, with Muhammad, at least uh, the more spiritualized uh, exegetes or interpreters of the Quran do that. So even though it has similarities to, to Zoroastrianism, the light metaphor is, is inherent to the, the Quranic tradition as well. Um, and then uh, the perfume garden, um, you find that quite a bit in imaginations of paradise in Islam. Uh, and you find uh, references to different perfumes in these Persian poetical texts. Um, you also find the mention of perfume in Islamic uh, biographical texts of the prophet. Um, there's a whole literary corpus known as the, the features and characteristics of the prophet Muhammad. And in those texts, um, authors have a lot to say about his hair and his beard. And we know that he perfumed his beard um, and that it emitted a, a very sweet smell of musk, ambergris, and so forth. So Muhammad was uh, considered a model of, of, of hygiene and personal care, of moral conduct. Uh, and so perfume being sweet smelling uh, was considered to be an outward, uh, outward feature of an inner goodness, according to the, the beautiful model tradition uh, that you find in Islam. I think we'll have to move on, Professor Gruber. And uh, um, if you would like to have people um, spend time in the breakout rooms with the video, you might want to ask them to watch last. And um, we'll have about 10 minutes for discussion. Sounds good. So uh, here are some other sources, and they're up in the Google Drive uh, for you. So if you want to know more about the, the Prophet Muhammad in Islamic visual cultures, you can just read some of the things that I've written uh, because that's uh, my field of expertise. Uh, which uh, brings me to something I wanted to share with you because you'll be bringing Islam into your classrooms. And uh, this past October, I launched a, an online scholarly initiative uh, that makes reliable scholarly resources for the teaching and learning of Islamic art free and openly accessible. Um, it's called Khamsin. Khamsin are, are strong seasonal winds. Um, and so uh, when you have COVID and other things, you gotta ride the winds of change and uh, we decided to go digital. So I can take you, I think, I don't know if it'll take me to the site, but you can pursue it uh, on your own time. What I'd like to do now is to uh, ask you to go into breakout groups and um, to, I think uh, Rima and Emma, you have the link, if you can put the link to the George Floyd video in chat, that would be great. Um, Rima, you might have some more things to say now. What I'd love for you to do is watch you know, uh, maybe seven or eight minutes of my presentation uh, about images of George Floyd in the Middle East. Um, make sure you select um, a group rep uh, among you. Somebody could volunteer. And when you come back, if you could put two to four major takeaways in chat, then we can uh, talk through it. Great. So I hope you uh, enjoyed the, the beginnings of that video, which uh, is up on the Hamsin website. Lots of videos on that website and resources including downloadable articles for each one of those videos. So what I'd love to ask you to do is to go ahead, um, each uh, representative, if you can just type in what you think would be some takeaways uh, from the video uh, for your students in particular, what you think could be a rubric or a thematic thread. Um, and then Rima will read those aloud and we can just pool then our, our minds as a brain trust. Absolutely. Um, someone says, Amy says, this shows the interconnections of the world, even in tragedy, use of symbols, the way that a person's individual story can be a metaphor for many stories globally. Mm -hmm. Powerful to see different ways to make a stand against what is seen as American oppression. Um, lots of comments about international metaphors, black brown solidarity suffering and disenfranchisement around the world. Um, 
Yes, lots, lots. Um, iconography, contemporary. Uh, lots of appreciation for metaphors for shared su suffering and, and liberation. Exactly. Uh, with, with this kind of iconography, you can tell that we're uh, entering a different landscape of expression, which is really a, a global contemporary language um, in which it's very hard to say this is Islamic art, but it still qualifies as visual culture from the Middle East, but it's highly engaged. It's a, it's a global art form. It partakes in the spirit of the streets, so it's not top-down uh, fine arts. There's sloganeering also, there's position taking. Uh, the, the position can be against another state entity, uh, as, as is the case for Iran. In the case of Syria, it can be a position against your own state. Um, and to actually take this metaphor, of course, George Floyd was a, is, was, is a human being, but he became a metaphor. So he became a metaphor for suffering uh, from from trauma, from violence within a state apparatus. Um, and so icons can be untethered from their original place and they can gain new lives and meanings. And that's really the power of the icon. It can really capture that that landscape of meaning making um, and it can shift with the, with territory and people. And so this is a really interesting case where you can talk about sort of global languages uh, to which Islam, uh, contributes in which it partakes. Um, and this is also a, a case study where you can maybe even assess issues of uh, brown black solidarity as, as was mentioned and, and a, a racial discrimination, whether it's of African Americans or, or Muslims. Uh, so there are alliances um, and parallels that can be made there. Were there any other comments Rima that you wanted to read? <laughs> I think a lot of what you we love the modern Katie says we love the the modern um, version of a religious icon uh, drawing connections across the spread of multiple movements iconography of Floyd as meaning solidarity um, uh, Irish troubles civil rights movements um, yes uh, speaking of the troubles Stephanie says there's a very powerful poem written by an Irish poet called George Floyd. Yeah, you know, what works really well for students is to do what we call in art history comparanda, which is comparative visual analysis and a critical analysis. So if you wanted to, you could put some of these murals um, with each other on the same slide, say the murals of Northern Ireland, like Belfast, right? You could, so you could put a, an Irish mural with this one, or you could put an American mural of George Floyd with one of these. Or speaking about comparative, if you're showing the uh, painting of the Ascension of the Prophet, you could have other examples where he's shown fully or completely abstractly. And so the Safavid painting is that in between, or depending on what your exercise is, you could take that painting of the Ascension and put it next to an image of Christ or an image of the Buddha Pada, the, the footprint of the Buddha, and then talk about how representational techniques um, sort of vary in place and time according to different traditions. So these are all part of a larger toolkit and you can really think about mixing and matching them in, in your own curricula, depending on what, what your learning outcomes uh, might be in, in your own modules. So uh, just to wrap it up, uh, Rima, are we at the three minutes now for you? 6.25 p.m. local time. So yes, uh, just a few minutes and we'll do housekeeping. Thank you, Professor Gruber. Excellent. So this is just to conclude in two minutes and then I'll hand it back to Rima. You'll notice that um, when you teach about Islam, there are all sorts of ways that you can do it. Um, lately, scholars have said, you know, it's fine to teach, of course, Islam through the Quran and through the Sunnah, so the traditional texts. But we also want to be careful to transcend what scholars call the legalistic doctrinaire approach. Not everything is about doctrine. Not everything is about law. Um, when we talk about uh, lived human experiences, oftentimes when we live as humans, we're not really engaging with doctrine and law. We're just practicing our, our creative expressions about what it means to be human. And if you, if you go through visual and material culture, you can get a different patina, a different nuance, a much more textured way of, of looking at, at Islam. And once you do that, you can't speak about Islam. You speak about Islams in the plural. 
Uh, and this is what scholars have been saying. It's really important to stress variety, um, to stress uh, the different colorations of the faith wherever it, it might present itself. Because if you do that, when you look at, at, at this multiplicity, then what you're actively doing is rejecting binaries. And binaries are the systemic cause of polarization. So you're inhabiting that third space, the tertiary space, which is the gray zone where everything happens and where things are really truly dynamic. Um, it can be an uncomfortable space, but that's where learning really truly happens. So on that note, I will uh, wrap up myself and hand it back over to Rima. Thank you so much, Professor Gruber, for that incredibly informative and, and uh, productively provocative presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone in the uh, in the session feels similarly. So um, have a wonderful evening. Um, we'll say goodbye to you now and we'll just do some housekeeping um, issues.